All right, so I got a couple of comments here that I want to go over. For I'll go to this one first by John D. Stan. He asks, "Why are you so stupid?" Well, you know I've been asking myself that very question for a very long time, and quite frankly, I don't know. I don't know why I'm so stupid. I really don't. Okay, now to Franklin Watt, thank and thank you for that. That's a great question. Great, good, great stuff right there. And um, now, if you're in disagreement with this, I would like to talk about that also. Okay, Franklin Watson has a great question here. Could you explain Isaiah 65 verses 20 and 24? Within the chapters, I ascribe to no denominations or sects. I believe the Father's word needs to be properly divided with truth. People who teach God's word should not err in the word. I completely agree with that, 100% wholeheartedly. These people with their grand religions have not a clue of where they live and so they make converts just like them. I know the wisdom of the Father will preserve its owners alive. The just shall live by faith. Most people are product of their own illusions, benefits of a deception perpetrated by an enemy. <clears throat> All right, so um, let's go to Isaiah 65 and we'll just read it and then I'll connect the dots and make parallels as we go forward. All right, Isaiah 65. I am sought of them that asked not for me. I am found of them that sought me not. I said, Behold me, behold me unto a nation that was not called by my name. I have spread out my hands all the day unto a rebellious people, which walks in a way that was not good, after their own thoughts. A people that provoke me to anger continually to my face, that sacrifices in gardens and burns incense upon altars of brick, which remain among the graves and lodge in the mountains which eat swine's flesh and broth of abominable things is in their vessels which say stand by thyself come not near to me for I am holier than thou these are a smoke in my nose a fire that burns all the day behold it is written before me I will not keep silence but will recompense even recompense unto their bosom <clears throat> your inequity or I'm sorry your iniquities and the iniquities of your fathers together saith the Lord which have burned incense upon the mountains and blasphemed me upon the hills therefore will I measure their former work into their bosom thus saith the Lord as the new wine is found in the cluster, and one saith, Destroy it not, for a blessing is in it, so will I do for my servants' sake, that I may not destroy them all. I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob, and out of Judah, inheritor of my mountains, and mine elect shall inherit it, and my servants shall dwell there. Okay, let's First of all, keep in mind, mountains is the same thing as the new city or the holy city, the new Jerusalem. Okay, same thing. Now, I will bring forth a seed out of Jacob. And, of course, that seed is Christ. All right, we go to Luke chapter 1, verse 33. And he shall reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there shall be no end. Alright, that's clearly talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, okay? And mine elect are clearly those of us 
that believe in him. And Sharon, Sharon, whatever, shall be a fold of flocks in the valley of Accor, a place for the herds to lie down in, for my people that have sought me. But ye are they that forsake the Lord, that forget my holy mountain, that prepare a table for that troop, and that furnish the drink offering unto that number. Therefore will I number you to the sword, and ye shall all bow down to the slaughter. Because when I called, ye did not answer. When I spake, ye did not hear, but did evil before mine eyes, and did choose that wherein I delighted not. Alright, so let's go um, um, draw a parallel with, and ye shall bow down to the slaughter. Now, a couple of places here I want to, uh, you know, this is, um, I guess we'd go to Matthew 13, where the, the end of the world is the harvest, and the tares are gathered up and burned. Alright, that's that's the slaughter all right the bow down to the slaughter okay and then also we can go here to revelation 20 and draw a parallel i mean there's lots of places but let's uh sort of uh, draw a connection here so and fire came down from god out of heaven and devoured them all this is the same thing when it bow down to the slaughter and so we can go to um, we can do this here when Jesus says for wheresoever the carcass is there will be the eagles or there will the eagles be gathered together so on the great day of the Lord when we are lifted up to meet the Lord in the air fire comes down from God out of heaven and devours them all so this is the great day of the slaughter all right this is goes all the way back to Genesis 3 verse 15 when it says I will put enmity between thee and the woman and between thy seed and her seed and it shall bruise thy head and it shall bruise and thou shall bruise his heel Right, and that's when Jesus stomps his foot on the head of the serpent and destroys it forever, and all the wicked will be slain. This is the slaughter that is spoken of in verse 12. All right. Therefore thus saith the Lord God, Behold, my servant shall eat, but ye shall be hungry. Behold, my servant shall drink, but ye shall be thirsty. Behold, my servants shall rejoice. But ye shall be ashamed. All right. So, uh, you know, my purpose for this is to hopefully make this really simple and easy for you all to understand. Okay. Because once you start connecting the dots, then your eyes are open, man, and you can see that all this stuff—it's not complicated at all. It's very simple very easy to understand but uh, it takes patience first of all it takes faith and it takes patience and it takes study now think about this Jesus says whosoever drinks of the water that I shall give him shall never thirst but the water that I shall give him shall be in him a well of water springing up into everlasting life right and what's it say here? Uh, therefore, let's see. Uh, the, Behold, my servant shall drink, but ye who are not saved shall be thirsty. Right? And then it says here, uh, Jesus says unto them, I am the bread of life. He that comes to me shall never hunger, and he that believeth on me shall never thirst. Right? My servant shall eat. Meaning those of us that are saved, those of us that are that believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, my servant shall eat and never be hungry. But ye shall eat and be hungry, right? Jesus is the bread of life, and behold my servant shall rejoice, but ye shall be 
ashamed. And so we, I mean, we can go to Daniel 12, verse 2. Then many of them that sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, and some to shame and everlasting contempt. Right? But ye shall be ashamed. Right? So the, his servants, those of us that are saved, have everlasting life. Those who are not saved, everlasting contempt. Shame and everlasting contempt. Now, behold, my servant shall sing for joy of heart, but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart, and shall howl for vexation of spirit. So let's go to two places here. Let's go to Luke 21. And um, Jesus uh, is talking about the end of the world. And he says, There shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars, and upon the earth distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear, and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth, for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. Now this is an accumulation of all the stress and anxiety upon the earth today all right it's going to get to this point it's going to accumulate and get to this point and then it's going to be destroyed dismissed forever all right and so this is also when um, when it says uh, and shall howl for a vexation of spirit this is also parallel with uh, the gnashing the weeping and gnashing of teeth all right and it says but ye shall cry for sorrow of heart and also we can read in Revelation 21 the God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes talking about those of us which are saved there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain alright and ye shall leave your name for a curse unto my chosen for the Lord God shall slay thee and call his servants by another name. Now there's two ways you can look at this. You can say, well, uh, the old name was the Jews. The Jews were God, the people of God, but now are we the people of God and we are called Christians. All right. That's one way to look at this. Oh, what am I doing here? Let's do it this way which in time past were not a people but now the people of God which had not obtained mercy but now have obtained mercy we Christians are the people of God and of course we can draw a parallel in Revelation oh, is it 21? it probably is it's probably Revelation I don't know where it's at Here, let's find it No, no, it was Revelation. And I will write upon him my new name, and in a stone a new name written, which no man knoweth, saving he that receiveth. So you, you could draw a parallel there also. But um, but let's, let's continue. Okay, so, but that he who blessed that he who blesses himself in a year shall be shall bless himself in the God of truth, and he that swears in the earth shall swear by the God of truth, because the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. Okay. So we you know our in our iniquities will be remembered no more. Okay, and blessed is he whom the Lord will not impute sin. All right. So again, um, the former troubles are forgotten, and because they are hid from mine eyes. All right. So you are sinless in the eyes of God once you are born of God. For behold, I create new heavens 
and a new earth, and the former shall not be remembered, nor come into mind. Same thing, Revelation 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first, first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. All right, see the parallels, the connections, just connect the dots. It makes it so much easier to see. And once you realize how simple it is, it, there's a, for me, there's a sort of a sense of relief knowing that, hey, this stuff is not rocket science. This is pretty simple, basic stuff. It can be known. It can be understood. Uh, first of all, you got to have faith. But then you also ha have to have patience, right? Just read, study the Word of God, believe the words that you are reading, believe the Bible that you hold in your hands, right? And then you connect these dots, and you realize, hey, this is this is not that complicated, right? It's not. The more you read it, the easier it becomes, right? But be ye glad and rejoice forever in that which I create. For, behold, I create Jerusalem a rejoicing and her people a joy. Right, speaking of the new Jerusalem, which is the promised land, which is in the resurrection, which is the world to come. And I will rejoice in Jerusalem and a joy in my people. And the voice of weeping shall be no more heard in her nor the voice of crying and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes and there shall be no more death neither sorrow nor crying neither shall there be any more pain for the former things are passed away there shall be no more thence in infinite days nor an old man that does that has not filled his days for the child shall die in a hundred years old but the sinner being a hundred years old shall be accursed. All right, so if we could just work backwards, I guess the sinner being a hundred shall be accursed. All right, so um, on judgment day, the sinners are cut off and um, they are uh, like what we read in, in uh, Daniel 12, verse 2, some shall... Um, resurrect to everlasting life and some to shame and everlasting contempt now where am I at here alright so the sinner is accursed forever alright and then the child being the child shall die in hundred years old now think of this as uh, a child you know we're all gonna be like little children uh, on the day of resurrection when we are changed in the twinkling of an eye we're gonna go through that at the very beginning when everything's gonna be new to us alright now but then you know after a hundred years we're no longer gonna be it's no longer gonna be brand new if you will now keep in mind this is very important because you know in the resurrection and and just by what we read here in revelation 21 there shall be no more death all right so when it says a child shall die we have to discern that this does not mean the man dies right so even though the child dies we live forever okay and you could think about uh, when I was a child, I spake as a child, and I thought as a child. Where's this at? I understood as a child. I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. All right, so those, so those childish things that we endure now, that we go through, these are all going to be done away with. And we will not be children no more, okay? But then I gotta see. So I gotta point out the fact that, um, except you come to me as a child. What's that verse? You shall not enter. 
the kingdom of God. So, uh, bear with me. What is that verse I'm thinking of here? Right here, this is it. Okay, and said, Verily I said unto you, except ye be converted and become as little children, ye shall not enter into the kingdom of heaven. Right, so essentially we want to have that mentality of a child ever learning and always full of fun. Right, just full of joy, happiness, eager to learn and um, obedient and all that sort of stuff right so um, that's how I would compare it and now there let's see the old man there will okay so there shall be no more thence in infinite days nor an old man that has not filled his day so um, in this life right now we have old men that die before they have filled their days this will not be this will not be the case in the resurrection all right neither will there be any more in infinite days so there there's not uh you know that growing process that we growth and mature and go through that sort of the different phases of life if you will that's all going to be that's all part of this world and the world to come is uh, much better much much better okay and so really you cannot read this verse and have it contradict anything in the Bible all right if it contradicts one thing you gotta throw out the entire Bible so you cannot teach that verse the idea that people are going to be dying in after the resurrection all right not it's not true it's not the case it would be an obvious contradiction and we have to rightly divide the word of truth and understand uh, the what these prophecies are teaching us and telling us and they shall build houses and inhabit them and they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them and they shall not build and another inhabit they shall not plant and another eat for as the days of a tree are the days of my people mine elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands all right again we have to understand that we're never going to die okay so when it says as the days of a tree are the days of my people you could imagine and theorize all that sort of stuff that a tree will eventually die, but we will never die. Okay, trees live a long life, as evidenced in our own lives today, but this is just sort of symbolic or representative of the fact that we have everlasting life, okay? Now, and when it talks, also when it talks about building houses and inhabiting them, vineyards and eating the fruit thereof this is all representative of a life to come not meant to be taken literal people make uh, too much out of this but it still holds true right so do you think about the world that we're living in now we're working for people we're doing things for people we're servants to rich people essentially not the case in the resurrection we will no longer be servants of rich people and building things and flipping burgers for them to make money all right you'll be flipping burgers so that you can eat a cheeseburger not so somebody else can eat a cheeseburger and so somebody else can get rich off of you flipping cheeseburgers right that sort of thing they shall not labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble for they are the seed of the, the blessed of the Lord, and their offspring with them. All right, again, there's not going to be marriages in the resurrection. All right, so 
all this is referring to is those of us which are saved because we are the seed of the blessed of the Lord right we are the elect of God so all this is saying is that we're not going to labor in vain nor bring forth for trouble and it shall come to pass that before they call I will answer and while they are yet speaking I will hear the, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together and the lion shall eat straw like the bullock and dust shall be the serpent's meat they shall not hurt nor destroy all my holy mountain saith the Lord now think about this here it says there shall be no more death all right so oops so you know how can the wolf kill the lamb when there is no more death all right so the way I perceive this is there's not going to be that desire written in their hearts to kill all right so that that's the way I perceive that this uh, world that is coming that is being prepared for us is going to be much much different than the world that we're living in now and I think these verses are examples of that verses 20 and 25 again these are examples of a world that is going to come and uh, obviously you've seen it I've seen it we all see people taking these verses out of context I mean you could take any verse out of context but to be to properly understand this very simple all right the world that is going to be coming the promised land if you will the new city the holy city the new Jerusalem in the resurrection there is no more death all right so whenever you see this you have to understand this correctly that the sinner will be destroyed and the saved will live forever all right so we have to understand these verses properly now you can theorize and um, you know throw out your viewpoints and talk about it that's great but it cannot contradict the Word of God at all all right, if it contradict if your theory your idea what you teach it contradicts the Word of God then you got a problem not the Bible the Bible's not wrong you would have to be wrong so that's the way I would explain it because there's a difference between being a child and being a man and there's going to be a time when we will be uh, new in the resurrection but in the resurrection we have everlasting life and therefore um, you know that's how I view that right so we'll no longer it'll no longer be brand new but we will have everlasting life and then of course the sinner is the unsaved the old man that you know there will be no more an in infinite days nor an old man that has not filled his days all right so you think about in the world that we're living in now there's a maturing process that we go through different phases of life that we go through and the old man that has not filled his days when that's not going to be the case anymore because there's no more death all right and then verse 20 oh sorry 24 and it shall come to pass that before they call I will answer and while they are yet speaking I will hear um, so to me this is just hey God is with us always uh, and I'm not so sure that we could understand it you know as well now 
because the world that is going to come is going to be much, much different. All right, let's do it this way. Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know that when he shall appear, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. All right, so also, this is clearly in the resurrection, and it shall come to pass that before they call I will answer and while they are yet speaking I will hear and you could say this is happening right now as well couldn't you and it shall come to pass that before they call I will answer and while they are yet speaking I will hear yeah maybe uh, maybe I could try to backpedal a little bit and say hey that's going on right now you know, I don't know. I, mean, I guess I didn't put a lot of thought into that particular verse. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. <clears throat> no, I mean, yeah, that has to be. I mean, God hears everything that we're thinking. And while they are yet speaking, I will hear. And it will come to pass that before they call I will answer God knows beforehand what we need and now that's okay All right, thank you for uh, being patient with me so you think about the flowers in the field okay I missed it I missed it hold on a second so you think about <clears throat> um, Goodness sakes, what's that verse I'm thinking of? It's one of my favorites. One of my favorites. One of my favorites. Alright, so this is great. This is going to be good, okay. Now hold on a second. Here, let me think. Um, oh, let's do it this way. I'm thinking of words one at a time here. One at a time. Okay, there it is. Matthew. <laughs> it's all right here in Matthew 6. Golly. Okay. Alright, so. The uh, first thing I want to point to is. Uh, when thou prayest, enter into thy closet. And when thou hast shut the door, pray to the Father. Pray to thy Father, which is in secret, and thy Father, which seeth in secret, shall reward thee openly. Alright. And then, um, go down here. Where's that? 30? There. Okay, this is what I love right here. Okay, therefore I say unto you, take no thought for your life, what ye shall eat, or what ye shall drink, nor yet for your body, what ye shall put on. Is not the life more than meat, and the body than raiment? Behold the fowls of the air, for they sow not, neither do they reap, nor gather into barns, yet your heavenly Father <coughs> feeds them. Are ye not? much better than they which of you by taking thought can add one cubit unto his stature and why take ye thought of for raiment consider the lilies of the field how they grow they toil not neither do they spin and yet I say unto you that even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these wherefore if God so clothe the grass of the field which today is and tomorrow is cast into the oven shall he not much more clothe you O ye of little faith therefore take no thought saying what shall we eat or what shall we drink or wherewithal shall we be clothed 
For all these things do the Gentiles seek, for your heavenly Father knows that ye have need of all these things. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto you. Take therefore no thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. All right, so I I show this to you. I show this to you because I I want you to see here. For your thought, your heavenly Father knows that ye have need of all these things. All right, and compare this to verse twenty-four, and it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer, and while they are yet speaking, I will hear. All right, the very similar, in my opinion, very similar verses in context. God knows what we need, and you could um, very easily see that this is happening right now. That God hears us. God knows what we need, and we can have absolute peace in Him. Those of us that believe and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. After all, he is uh, called the Prince of Peace. And of course, how can you have peace if you do not believe in him, if you do not believe in eternal security? It's impossible to have peace without it, but he has promised us peace. And he gives us a peace that is not like the peace that the world might seem to give you, right? Peace I leave with you, my peace I give unto you, not as the world gives, give I unto you, let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. So um, hopefully this gives you a clear understanding, you asked about verses 20 and 24, and I think it helps to understand the context of the whole entire chapter, what we're getting into, what we're talking about. And of course, um, you can see here that there are 66 chapters in the book Isaiah. So there's one more chapter after this one. And um, hopefully this helps in some way. Uh, because I I tell you this is not rocket science number one and then number two it's not a conflict with anything else that we're reading in the Bible right all we have to do is connect the dots and then understand and again I'm gonna say it that when Jesus talks about the end of the world and the end uh, that is to come he explains it better than anybody and then, of course, what we're reading here is uh, we get a few descriptions of what it's going to be like in the resurrection. All right, so we have to be um, understanding of that and then also um, not be naive uh, to what is being written here in the sense that... Um, you think about uh, eating of the fruits right there they shall plant vineyards and eat the fruit of them now I would just be a little bit uh, cautious if you will Um, think about are we going to grow grapes for example and eat the grapes if we eat the grapes and then we're gonna poop the grapes. Now, are we? Gonna, is that going to be the case in the resurrection? And I would have to say no. That's not the case. So this is a. We have to understand this in a spiritual sense. Uh, with spiritual meaning, it's true, but uh, don't take it literal. Uh, and the reason I say that is because. We eat now so that we can live. 
but in the resurrection we already have everlasting life so it's not like hey there's a grape I'm hungry I gotta eat that's not the way the world's gonna be in the life to come right so uh, you know if you don't eat anything are you gonna die if you don't drink anything are you gonna die that's not the case at all I don't believe because obviously there's no more pain so you're not going to suffer hunger pains you're not going to suffer being thirsty you're not going to die at all there's not going to be pain sorrow no more death all right so the reason why we eat is to stay alive but once we have everlasting life in the resurrection there is no longer going to be that desire. So, if we understand that, then we can read this and understand this has to be uh, speaking spiritually. And of course, we also got to understand we don't know what exactly it's going to be like, right? Just like what we read in First John chapter three, if I remember right. Verse 2, Beloved, now are we the sons of God, and it does not yet appear what we shall be. And it does not yet appear what we shall be. Alright, so let's not try to be all-knowing and say, well, this is what it's going to be like. You know, it's fine to speculate, but when you speculate on what this is going to be like, you cannot contradict the Word of God at all all right so i think that i think i've gone long enough but man if you want to talk about this more you want to talk about chapter 66 if you need me to elaborate on something you if you got like another verse that says well how do you uh, reconcile these two verses that sort of thing let's talk about that so i think this is great uh, a great uh, chapter and uh, it's for me i mean when you compare it and draw parallels with what we're reading in the New Testament, it makes it that much easier to understand. It makes everything more simple and easy. And I have had to put a lot of study into this. I have to read these things a lot because I'm stupid. And because I'm stupid and I'm not smart, it takes me more effort. It takes me more time reading and studying and drawing this, these comparisons, right? Because without these comparisons, without these parallels, without being able to connect the dots, I'm just too dumb. I really am. I'm not smart like John D. Sten, so I have to put in the extra effort to understand what the Word of God is saying. Okay? Alright, thanks. Thanks, guys.